Thank you everyone <laughs> for braving the elements to join us here today and welcome live streamers. Are we live? We're live. We're live. All right, cool. So it, there's a few of us that, that work to put this together. Um, John is running the AV in the back. I'm Ian. Um, we've got uh, two members who help out with the, uh, the study group. We've got someone that helps out finding speakers and coaching speakers. And our sponsors, uh, coordinator Matt Morgan, he is looking to step down. So if anyone is interested in helping to coordinate with sponsors and uh, help out with also the, uh, the jobs email, um, let me know. Send us an email at hello at smjs.org and uh, we'd love the help. So we have a code of conduct. You can find it at coc.smjs.org. I'm gonna to try to go through this a little bit quick so we can get home at a reasonable hour. Um, yeah, so sponsors are also key to what we do here. We wouldn't be able to have our meetings and uh, wouldn't be able to have food. Nobody would come if there was no food, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a real big help to us and Atomic Object has been great to sponsor both the location tonight and the pizza in the back. Do you wanna come up here to the camera and just say a few words about Atomic Object? Uh, hey everyone, yeah, uh, Atomic Object is a uh, custom software development software consultancy. We're located here in Ann Arbor. Um, this is our building. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're looking to hire some senior developers this year. Um, I, if you're looking to get a new experience, get behind a lot of different projects, uh, lead teams, um, it's really exciting. I absolutely love working with everybody that I work with here. Uh, and I, I think that's really unique. I had a lot of internships where it's filled with people that I worked with and Atomic is definitely different. I love working with everybody who works here. So, yeah, awesome. uh, feel free to stop at, uh, you can go to our website, we have careers listed there, and we also have it listed right here in that URL. Thanks a lot. Cool. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> cool. Uh, yeah, we've also got the, some of the AV equipment has been supplied by Symphono and, and John's time up here to sort of help out with, uh, with the AV. And then uh, giveaways, we always give away a, uh, a license to one year of JetBrains for free at the end of the meetup. Um, We'll, we'll figure out a way to do that with a small group. Maybe it's just like someone who wants it, let me know, and then you'll get it. I don't know if we necessarily need to have a contest tonight. Oh, uh, one other thing. We are looking for a sponsor for December's meetup. So if any of you have a company or uh, you know, want to sponsor us, it usually involves bringing pizza or something for about 30 people. Um, usually it's more than this, but uh, hopefully the weather will be better by then. We'll see. Uh, it is December, but you know, we'll see. Uh, so yeah, if you're interested in sponsoring, uh, let us know at sponsors at smgs.org, uh, and then that puts you sort of on our active sponsors list and gives you uh, access to, if anyone emails us looking for jobs, then we send them your way. Uh, we have our SEMJS meetups on the second Monday of every month at 6 p.m. The location changes. Next month will be our first meetup in the new Cahoots space, which is one block north of here. On, uh, on Huron. And it's going to be a really cool talk from uh, my boss, Chris Kane, uh, talking about Storybook and, and uh, sort of developing components in isolation from the rest of your app. Uh, we're also looking for speakers uh, starting next year in January. So if anyone has a talk that they want to give or an idea, it can be either a lightning talk, which is like five to 10 minutes, or a full length talk like we're about to have, um, which is closer to 45 minutes or an hour. Um, and we're happy to sort of help you develop a, a talk and a topic and work through any details. We also do a study group the fourth Monday of every month, so it's two weeks after tonight. Uh, and that's always over at Ithaca, sort of across the street. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's a much more informal group where there's a few people that kind of get together and just work on projects, hack, um, talk, whatever. Uh, that's a fun time. All right, I also like to sort of like let people know about other meetups that are coming up in the area. Uh, we have Ann Arbor JSX uh, tomorrow night talking about Re React Concurrent Mode. Uh, Rochester Full Stack, which is one week from tonight. Uh, this, Henry Marshall gave this talk here at SEMJS a few months ago, and it was an excellent talk. So if you missed that one, I'd recommend you try to make it up to Rochester and, and listen to that. It's a, it's a really fun time. He does like a regex uh, crossword or, uh, yeah, it's, it's really fun. Uh, A2Go has a meeting, and then uh, Detroit React Users Group has a meeting the same night, so you've got some options. Um, that one is from Ryan Lancio, 
Uh, he is the speakers coordinator for some jazz. Um, and he's going to be talking about sort of culinary inspired uh, development. So I'm really interested to see what that one's about. Does anyone else know of any other cool things coming up, going on? Code Bash is in January. I think early bird tickets prices is bump to their next level. But so too late to be cheap, but. No, it's still, <laughs> it's still cheap as, as conferences go. As, Extended conferences go. Um, if you have never been, it's a good time. Uh, it's at the Kalahari in Sandusky the second week of January. So if you've ever wanted to go to a water park in the middle of the winter, this is usually you so. <laughs> yes? Uh, All Hands Active, the downtown makerspace, has their uh, anniversary party on the 23rd. Okay. I think that's a Saturday. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, they're down uh, in the basement below Afternoon Delight on Liberty. Awesome. Are they on Meetup then, I assume? Okay. Anything else? All right. So I mentioned our jobs email. Um, this is how I got my current job in a nutshell. Uh, if you are sort of curious what uh, companies in the area are looking for uh, people like you to hire, let us know. Uh, just send us a note at SEMJS, uh, jobs at semjs.org, and we will put you in touch with our sponsors, whoever you're sort of interested in talking with. Uh, and, and start the conversation. That's a great way to sort of get introduced to, uh, to local employers. Uh, I, does anyone actually want to go to the bar and chat and talk to you? Yeah, here. We better. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm not sure I'll make it, but uh, if, if any of us want to, uh, we'll head across the street to MASH. Uh, we'll see how that goes. I still have to drive home tonight. <laughs> it's just getting worse and worse out there. Yeah, right? No, I did not bike to do this. <laughs> Might have been safer than driving, we'll see. All right, so uh, we're going to hear from Matt about uh, PWAs, and uh, let's, let's give, it a, give it up for Matt. talk, you know, try to be catchy because I get, uh, this is about the third time now I've given this presentation. Um, get progressive with it. We're going to talk about progressive web apps. A um, little bit about me, just <laughs> so you know. Um, you, actually, you're going to bear with me for one second because this is still in mirror mode, which is going to drive me, which is going to be a problem, actually, because there's things I need to see in there. Uh, come back. Come back. <laughs> Do we still have you? It's on the wrong one? No, I don't know. We bought. Great. Hang on. Does he just need to go back to mirror Okay. Do you want me to switch back or. We're good? We're good? Okay. Let me. As soon as I find the, <laughs> I need to see my speaker notes. Sorry. Yeah. Good. All right. We're good. Okay, we're gonna go back a half a dozen slides. There we are. Okay, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm Matt Forst. Uh, I know I met at least two or three of you at different times here. Um, I've worked with a couple of you. Um, I live in Brighton. If you don't know where that is, just go on 23 North and keep going for about 15 minutes. Not that far from here. Um, I work for TED conferences. Uh, the big people who have the speakers with the big red circle on the ground, that's them. If you're not familiar, just go look. It's not hard to find. Um, I work as a so uh, senior software engineer. Um, primarily, I work in JavaScript. Um, I work in lots of languages. I spent the last, most of the last week actually doing Rails upgrades in Ruby, which is kind of comical because I'm not really a Rubyist, but you do what needs to be done. Um, I have no, there's like this concept of free time thing and being able to do things like this is a challenge. I have to thank my wife for even letting me come out and do stuff. I have three kids under the age of six and a dog. Uh, this is our youngest, Sean. Um, this is actually for a little while ago now. He's about 16 months now. Um, so it's a little bit chaotic, you know, and I work full time remote from home. So that's just, we feel like upping the challenge. <laughs> You're very glad to be. Yes, it's, this is a vacation. Um, we, go, we have our uh, team get-togethers twice a year, um, and 
everybody stays up until two in the morning, then we get up and do stuff at like seven, eight o'clock, and then like, <coughs> you can tell the difference between the parents and the non-parents, because the parents keep getting pressure as the week's going on, and the non-parents are like slowly sliding into this abyss. <laughs> so in 1990, uh, Tim Berners-Lee created the first web page on the internet uh, at CERN. Um, this is what it looked like. Uh, it's actually still up. You can still go to it. I don't know what the URL is. You're on your own there. Um, and probably someone should talk to him about his design because <laughs> it feels like it's a little lacking, but it's, it's been there. Um, worth noting that cell phones around that time, even by the primitive standards of what your, uh, the web pages looked like, the cell phones at the time not so capable of doing much of anything with that. They were barely capable of displaying numbers in a readable format, let alone that. Uh, we jump forward a few years. In uh, 1995, Netscape and Sun formed an alliance to counter Microsoft. Um, and the old joke at the time is that the, uh, Brendan Ike, who worked for Netscape at the time, created JavaScript called Mocha uh, in 10 days. This is twisting the real facts around the matter, but most of the develop most of the like core development practice that be for the language that became JavaScript that we know and love at the time was developed over that week and a half period of time. Hence why JavaScript is what it is. Um, cell phones really hadn't gotten much better yet. We still weren't really capable of displaying a web, the original web page, let alone the web pages that were being written in 1995. And then a funny thing happened. In 2004, Gmail was released. In 2005, Google Maps were released. These were both big fundamental shifts. Both Gmail and Google Maps upped the usage of JavaScript within their applications by a massive degree. Um, they changed the way people thought things should behave on the internet, or thought the way things could behave on the internet. Um, cell phones at the time had taken actually a pretty big leap by this. We actually had full color displays, rendered text, a whole bunch of things. Uh, and if you went to either Gmail or Google Maps on this phone, if it did load, you got a phone bill for about $7,000. Um, more importantly, around that time, a different type of phone had started to, to emerge, which was smartphones. Even in their primitive form, the smartphones were a pretty big leap forward. Um, you could actually see full emails and like basic web pages. They weren't a lot to write home about, but they could do stuff. And then in 2007, we got a, new, a big shift in the world. Um, when even though there had been smartphones before this point, the release of the iPhone kind of changed the game in terms of what people thought a phone was capable of delivering. And a funny thing happened when the iPhone was released. Um, Steve Jobs had this to say when he released the iPhone, because this is something that a lot of people don't remember about the iPhone. When the iPhone was released, there were no native applications. The App Store, the gigantic App Store that everybody is so wrapped up in originally, didn't exist. The idea was for people to build web applications and for the phone to use the web applications to deliver apps to the users. That was what Apple was gunning for at the original at the time. The problem was we were using HTML4, which was originally developed in 1999. I, I don't know how many people are using computer equipment or technology that was built eight years ago at this point, but let me tell you, it's you're behind the curve. <laughs> HTML5, its predecessor, it's the follow-on to HTML4 wasn't even uh, released as a recommendation, let alone fully adopted in 2014, seven years after the iPhone came out. The web, despite, all, despite what Steve was hoping for, hadn't quite caught up. You can see this even more. JavaScript 3 was the predominant form of uh, JavaScript at the time when uh, Steve Jobs made that, thing, made that proclamation. Um, it had also been released in 1999. The JavaScript 5, it's the follow-on. We will never, ever speak of JavaScript 4. It does not exist. Do not look it up. Don't find out what happened there. Um, didn't come out until 2009, so two full years after. While a lot of the ideas have been starting to percolate, like the, for, the, the basis of what would become JavaScript 5 wasn't formalized for two years after Steve Jobs made that proclamation about we're gonna build web apps on the iPhone and then realizing that, guess what? The browsers really just aren't capable of doing what people would like phones to be able to do. And so in October of 2007, several months later, the Apple announced the, that they were going to release a native SDK. Um, no, no more web standards were used in Objective-C. 
they they just said, you know what, that web thing, we're, we're just gonna go and build apps on the phone. And then they realized they could make a lot of money doing that, so they doubled down on that technology. And then the app store opened in July of 2008. So a little more than a year after the iPhone originally came out, Apple had completely shifted course away from that idea of building using web apps to build it when they realized that, nope, developers just aren't happy with that experience. They wanted something more. Well, some people said, you know what, but building these native apps, it's really hard. Like, I've got a whole slew of web developers sitting in my back pocket, right? And they know how to build web stuff, but I, I don't have people who can write code in Objective-C to make a good application. So people started coming out with things like PhoneGap and Cordova, which wrapped, took the web view that was present inside of the iOS web stack and wrapped, an wrapped a web page in it. And users absolutely hated every single one of those that was ever written because they were horrible. That it just never felt quite right. Um, a few years later, React came out, the React team came out with this idea of, hey, we're gonna take and we'll actually have you write regular JavaScript in a form that you're used to in React and we'll bundle it together with a thing called React Native and we're gonna use actual native components. This felt better. But at the same time, there was another move that was going on and that was the move towards progressive web applications. And this was being worked on simultaneously to when the releases were coming up for React Native and that. Um, and this came out of a group in Google originally, um, and they coined the term, uh, it was by Francis Berman and Alex Russell, they coined the term progressive web app in 2015. Okay, what is a progressive web app? So we're gonna, cover, we're gonna go through this whole big wheeling thing, but I want you to think about it this way. So we took the web originally, it was about building a web page, and a web page really was, think of it as a book with an infinite number of chapters and an infinite number of ways of navigating, you know, skipping through it. It was like a choose your own adventure book that was put into a computer. That's what the web functionally in a lot of ways was. But you didn't interact with it much. You said, you go down here and you can choose the link to go to this page or you can choose the link to go to this page, but the web pages really didn't do much. And then we started building applications on the web and then we started building hybrid web apps around the same concepts of, hey, no, we can do certain things. We can make behaviors happen. And then we can take these native, then we can take things like React Native, which was taking these native web technologies and building real native applications out of the core web technologies that you saw. Progressive web apps take, turns that thing on your head. Instead of building native applications, what you're actually looking at is using the web as your platform rather than iOS, rather than Android, rather than the very myriad of different things. And this extends to beyond the no mobile devices that we talk about, which I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking there because it's the real reason why I think you should invest in progressive web apps is around mobile. But it also extends to things like, hey, guess what? We've already been living in this idea of the web as a platform on a desktop, right? If you go to a website on a Mac, you expect it to behave the same as if you went to the website on a Windows computer. You don't expect those experiences to be functionally different from one another. And this idea around the web as a platform is, hey, we can build something that will run in different places that will be appropriate and behave correctly for the different locations that you're gonna run it in. So there's a series of tenets around building a progressive web app. Um, it needs to be responsive, so it needs to handle different screen sizes, different input types, different ways of behaving that are appropriate for the device that you're, looking, you're using it for. Um, it needs to be connectivity independent. Okay, that's gonna, if that doesn't pause you for a second, I just said your website needs to work when it's not on the web. So we're gonna cover that, or, or the basics of what that means, but the big thing I'm gonna be pushing as we go through this is things need to be app-like. They need to behave like somebody, and functionally like someone who's on their phone, when they open up their app, right, they expect it to behave with certain parameters. Building a progressive web app, you can't break those assumptions. You need to think about what's the use, what, if I was building a native app, what would the user expect to happen when I did X? And if you can't deliver that, then you are building it in a progressive web app, then you shouldn't be building a progressive web app for your solution. And we'll talk about some of the limitations of progressive web apps too. Um, it needs to be fresh, which means you need to be able to not just rely on cache data. So you don't shove all the data down to them when they first install the progressive web app and then never do stuff. It needs to still be able to talk to the network when the network is available and be able to behave properly for that. It needs to be safe for the users. Um, this is a big one and we're gonna talk about it in a couple things, a couple ways in this, and it's gonna be a recurring theme throughout there. But basically, 
for the progressive web apps to be what they can be in the broader society and allow us to build them and act as if they are realistic competitors with native applications, they need, at the end of the day, users need to trust your progressive web app the same way that they trust an app that they install on their phone from the app store. Which means we need to be careful about how we behave towards the users and make sure that we're not violating their expectations in there. Um, it needs to be discoverable, which means they, people need to be able to get into it in a myriad of different ways. Um, it needs to be re-engageable, and we'll talk about what that means coming up. Um, it needs to be installable. Yes, you can get a progressive web app to be on the home screen of someone's phone or their iPad or take your pick. Um, I actually run Twitter as a progressive web app now. I don't bother with their native client, um, and it works most of the time. Um, and it needs to be linkable just like it was, just like a regular website should. You can't break the rules around building a website. Not all of your pages should have one URL. Don't do that. We know better. We've done that before. Please don't go back to that. So progressive web apps all have all of the limitations of a browser and all of the rock solid dependability of, mo of mobile devices. Um, if anybody here doesn't know what I'm talking about there, check with me after. But uh, if you've worked with either of these two things, you get to understand the horrifying nature that that provides. <laughs> really, what you're dealing with here is you need to start thinking like a mobile developer um, if you're going to build progressive web apps. This doesn't mean that you're throwing your uh, desktop users out the door. In fact, if you do that, you're doing things wrong. But when you're when you start building for mobile devices, you start living within a constrained world in a number of places, and you need to think about those constraints as you're building up your application, because those constraints are going to govern a lot of the decisions that you make. So we're going to sit and walk through those bullet points I just gave you, and we'll talk about how each of them applies and what you have to do with each of them. So your site needs to be responsive. Um, there's two thought lines when it comes to building responsive design stuff. You start big, you plan for big by default, and then scale it down or start from small and scale it out. I'm going to tell you, you will make your life easier every single time if you start small and work, go, okay, and when they hit this size, then we can start allowing for this thing. Anytime you start with the biggest available real estate piece that you can go work with and then try to scale it down, you're, you start thinking of, oh look, I've got to take all of these things I managed to shove on this giant screen and make them somehow available on a smaller screen, which becomes really difficult to do and is a really awkward decision. If you start from the constraint space of saying, this is the space I have on a small screen, what can I provide my users on that space? And when it becomes bigger, you're, added, you're treating it additively, which is a much easier way to think about um, than trying to constrict those original decisions down. Um, he, one of the things that you now need to start thinking about is portrait versus landscape. Generally speaking, users don't pick up the monitor on their computer and just suddenly go, I'm going to go like this now and expect the screen to change and do something. But people do that with their phones. Um, I do it with my phone all the time for a very simple reason of, hey, look, it's a lot easier for me to, this, the text on this gets bigger if I take my phone and go like this. So it makes it easier for me to read. Um, so there's a whole series of reasons why you need to start thinking about your screen and how it's going to display in both those modes. And it's not always going to be the same. I spend most of my time here talking about phones, right? But this apply, progressive web apps apply just as much to tablets. And with a tablet, you may, going from portrait to landscape, you may completely change the basic layout. Um, Apple's, a lot of the Apple applications are very famous for this. Like if you're looking at mail on an iPad in landscape mode, it's a different, completely different experience than if you look at it in portrait mode. And you need to consider things like that and what's appropriate for what you're doing. Um, the other thing you're gonna get is really weird screen sizes. Um, so I mentioned that I work at TED. We started see, all of a sudden seeing a slew of requests for wa people watching TED Talks on screens that had a resolution of, I want to say it was 320 by 240, um, which is disconcerting for us because we don't know how our site even works at 320 by 240. Um, but what it was is we found out that, hey, look, there's actually still feature phones in the world. They're all in India. Um, and they're being used there. And so you need to start thinking about your app and how it's gonna behave under those types of constrained sizes that you've never considered before. Um, and you, let me, the upside shot to all this is there's a whole bunch of new technologies, most of which are pretty widely supported, one of which I'm gonna talk about in just a moment, that make a lot of this easier. 
um, and make it a lot harder to think, a lot easier to wrap your head around because traditionally speaking, responsive web layouts have been really difficult to implement, and especially to follow and understand the code that you built later on to understand what's happening and why it's happening. What, why did I float this thing this way to, and it's that. The big one that I'm gonna point out, which had, especially in terms of the major um, phone platforms and the major browser platforms, everything except for IE 11 at this point supports CSS grid across the board. You can use it reasonably safely at this point. Um, if you are dealing with a, an application that needs IE 11 support, that's really your one uh, reason to maybe consider not doing it. But there are ways around that and you can research, how do I build a site that will degrade into IE 11, a CSS grid site that will degrade into IE 11 gracefully. Um, and normally it comes down to, instead of having the grid layout, you're gonna end up, it's gonna end up like you would de traditionally deal with a mobile thing where it's gonna stack on top of itself. Um, there, CSS Grid is one of the two new layout technologies that have come out for uh, the web life. The other one is Flexbox. Flexbox is meant for, it's really, I always deal with this, for single dimensional, but really it's for either crossway uh, columns or rows, right? And I just did those completely backwards with the hand motions. Um, but it doesn't, do, it doesn't do both of them at the same time. CSS Grid, the big difference, allows for two, true two dimensional layouts. So all of the games we used to play in CSS and all the uh, different libraries like uh, Bootstrap providing, hey, this is how you get a flexible grid in CSS. You don't, don't have to do those anymore. And um, the really nice thing is you can actually be semantic in your layouts in ways that you've never really been before. You can define what the layout looks like semantically, sep really separating some of the uh, markup portions of it in ways that you, we talked about, or have always talked about doing the CSS, but never really could perform well. Um, and it's, as I mentioned with IE11, it's easier to lay on, layer on top of to still support older browsers without breaking them completely. So what does this look like? So let's take a relatively simple layout. You know, you guys can read this markup, I'm hoping, and understand the basics of what's intended to be done here. I've got a header, I've got a main area, I've got a sidebar and a footer, right? Um, just giving you a couple of the CSS pieces, like I can say for my site header class, I'm going to give it a grid area of header. For my main, I'm gonna give it a grid area of main. This is the point where, it really win, where you really win. So for my overall class here, I can now say, I'm gonna display grid, I'm gonna set up my columns and rows. Um, I'm not gonna dive deep into what these particular means. There's a lot of great CSS grid stuff out there that will explain that. But the really nice thing is I can define template entities and say, hey, guess what? I, in this thing, I'm, my header is going to be all down the left column here in these three rows, and I'm going to have my main here, my sidebar, and my footer, right? Now I can look at this and go, wait a minute, my header is supposed to be up across the top here, and my sidebar goes down the side. Why did I set it up that way? And I can look at this and immediately understand what the layout is in ways that I couldn't previously do. So it gives you that ability to visually see in your CSS what the layout of my site is, Whereas previous responsive design sites, you were always like looking at it going, what, why, how did this thing end up over here? And you're like reading through this deep nest of CSS rules to understand how this thing ended up in the location that it did. The thing you need to be careful here is there's the concept of the uncanny valley, right? Um, this is why if you've ever watched the movie The Polar Express, you're horrified because it looks like Tom's, Tom Hanks is looking deep into your soul because there's no life to his eyes. Um, you want to try to use the native components where possible. And let me explain what that means. Um, how many people here have built a date picker for a browser? Fair number of people. The reason why we always end up doing this is because the native date pickers in, browser, in desktop browsers are awful. They are horrible. Um, I've tried to use them several times. They just, the user experience is just not pleasant. And they're virtually impossible to style. So they stick out from the rest of your site like a sore thumb. So we always play these games to replace the native date picker stuff with the ones that come out of um, the, the, the ones that come with the browser. Okay, you need to figure out a way to detect when you're on a mobile application and provide the native date picker because guess what? A user on a phone knows how to enter in a date on their phone because they've got native stuff to do that. 
select boxes are another great one. Everybody on the web relates select boxes because they never, they never look aesthetically correct to your website. So that's great. Do that on your desktop site and make sure that when you're on the mobile on the mobile version of it, when they're on their phone, that you're using the native one because the native one's going to have proper acceleration when they scroll up and down, spin up and down through the things. It's gonna pop up the native select picker on the bottom. It's just like if they were in a, in a regular mobile application. Use the native, you wanna make sure you're using the native bits where you can, but don't try to be native where you can't. This is the uncanny valley, right? If I try to like mirror something that's in mobile, it's gonna feel off. And this is where hybrid apps always fell, fell apart because they kind of looked like they were native applications but never be behaved like they were. And that just broke people's expectations. You need to focus on smoothing the experience. So you now need to start paying more attention than you ever have to things like the animations in and out. Um, you, the making sure that things behave the way that they ex people are going to expect them to on mobile apps. The expectations of people for how a mobile app behaves are a lot tighter than you've ever dealt with on a desktop application. You've entered into a new, much more rigorous world and you need to be aware of that. Um, you need to make things flexible so they behave properly for their own context at the end of the day, right? This is what I was just talking about. Use native components where you can, don't use them where it doesn't make sense. Use in on the desktop applications, if it doesn't fit the aesthetic of your site, then don't use that. But Make sure you're looking at the individual proper things so that they behave correctly. Okay, so connectivity independence. That's our next big bullet point. Um, operations the user is going to assume will work offline need to work offline. That means if you are building a progressive web app around the user's camera, they're going to expect the camera to still work even if they can't get signal for their cell phone. Because guess what? If they open up the camera app on their phone, it works just fine. So why doesn't your app work just fine when it's using the camera? And the, so you need to be thinking about everything you do. It is, is this something the user is going to expect to work when they're offline? Um, obviously, look, there are limitations to this. They're not going to get the most recent news in the world if they can't get online. Users understand that. We joke about users all the time, but the fact of the matter is your users are not as dumb as we think they are at times, right? They understand some of those things and say, oh, I don't, I, can't, I don't have any connectivity. It will frustrate them, but they're not going to blame the app. They'll normally blame their cell phone provider because none of us like our cell phone providers. Um, but the thing that this now introduces that you've not had to think about before is um, slow and unstable connections. Um, you're going to deal with things going slower than you've ever expected them to. Uh, people are not hooked into their nice cable line that has 150 megabits of bandwidth and very low latencies. That's not what a cell phone work looks, a cell phone connection looks like. And you're gonna get completely nonsensical things happening that you've never even thought were possible from a network connection. Um, I can uh, introduce you to some of my friends who have done a lot of data development and they will tell you uh, like horror stories like these just completely random look random behaving network behaviors that don't make any sense when you sit down as a web as a desktop web developer but happen all the time in mobile land. Um, requests returning in an order that don't make any sense um, where you make a handshake but then the request just completely fails afterwards which almost never happens in desktop web development like just completely nonsense type behaviors. Um, the good news is we've got something in the works that can cover a lot of these warts up and that's called a service worker. Service workers are the workhorse of the whole progressive web app thing. Um, and what they really are is an application that your application talks to. Um, they sit between your application and your server. They're essentially super powered proxies that allow you to do a whole bunch of work uh, in between them and they can also manage a few other things which we'll talk about down the road. Um, so their net network level proxying for your API requests is the best way of thinking about that. Um, they integrate well with the direct caches that are built into the browser. They actually can talk and talk, update the browser cache um, directly, do a whole bunch of slew of other things that are directly through JavaScript, and they can also talk to IndexedDB. Um, there are limitations. Um, you can push messages to the UI thread, um, but 
Service workers are only active when people are, are on the site. They aren't sitting there running all the time under normal situations. Um, so there's limitations on what you, they can do. Um, the one thing that you need to be aware of if you start developing with a service worker is unless you're in a development environment, they require HTTPS, period. You don't get a choice in the matter. That's the way the system is actually set up. It will not let you install a service worker if you are not on an HTTPS connection. Um, the other thing I will tell you is 90% of the time when you are in development, you want to turn the service worker off um, because having a caching proxy between you and your development server is something that's liable to drive you utterly insane. Um, I'm not going to dive too deep into this. Um, so I mentioned code when Ian uh, brought up stuff coming up. I mentioned CodeMash. I'm actually giving a workshop on this on Progressive Web App in, at CodeMash. Um, and that's where I actually dive into a lot more of the code that's associated with this and how you actually build with these things. Um, but there's a life cycle involved with service workers. Um, basically they start, if you go into your uh, control panel, you can see it installing and then it'll be installed. This is, it goes through this installing phase, which is when it's downloading the service worker from the server. And then when it's installing, um, it then does the, it then allows you to go and cache assets so you can like grab your icons and all your other stuff that you need to store in the cache inside the service worker and then it waits to wait until the next time you visit to actually activate so it just sits there in that installed state waiting the next time you come back to it it comes into activate and then you can do a few other things then it's running and then it finally gets disposed of when the next version of the service worker comes in the good news is about this is your service worker won't get updated a lot. Once you get the core bones to your service worker put in place, it will just kind of sit there and do its job in the background. You don't need to futz with it a lot. Because um, there's a few hiccups that come when you update the version of your service worker because it downloads a whole new set of assets and you don't know which version of the service you're going to, you potentially could have two versions of the service worker running out there in the wild for a while um, until things update. Um, but this is there's a life cycle to it that you need to understand in terms of how and when things happen and what the right behavior is. Um, registering the service worker is pretty darn easy. You just call to the navigator, service worker register, you give it an address. Um, this involves a thing called the scope. Um, service workers work at or below the scopes that, for which they are installed. So if this said dot slash books slash service worker, it will only work on API points underneath books. Service workers are specific to the scope at which they are installed. You can actually pass a second parameter to this register method that defines a different scope than what you're at. So there's ways you can tweak around that behavior. Um, if your app runs under whatever your top level domain is slash app, for instance, you could say, hey, look, the service worker is only valid for app, but you can install it the first time they visit your site. Um, the, when it's installing, you set it up to cache your assets. You give it a set of URLs to cache. It goes through, loads them all into cache. Pretty straightforward. It's not, again, not complicated code. When I talked about it interacts well with the caches you're dealing with, this is the way you interact with caches within JavaScript land. Literally, there's a caches uh, system out there that you can, top level object that you can deal with. Um, it's at top level? Yes. Okay. And it's, if you search for JS cache, you'll find all that there. It's, it's not, again, not difficult to do. Um, <laughs> Once you have it cached, you can actually then set up caching for your dynamic requests. So things that you, the, you would expect the user to be able to do once they visit your site. Like, hey, if you're building a new site, if they go to an individual article, you can cache the response for the individual article, right? So you can do all of those pieces, store the, look to see if you've already got the request, hand it back if you do, and otherwise you can go get it. And with some more fancy techniques, you can even do things like, hey, I'm gonna serve this thing, give it a piece of information that it's loading, and then turn around and fetch it in the background and push an update to it. So you can do with some tricks and there's, I'll reference the site in a little bit, um, that's got some of these different recipes on how you build like that type of behavior in. Um, you can do things like show an immediate response and then refresh it in the background and behaviors like that. Um, so you can, what I just said, you can return a response, update and refresh. Um, you can serve content when you're offline. That's one of the neat things about service workers. Because they're acting as a proxy and they can look within the caches, as long as it's data that they have locally, you can serve it immediately, even if they're not online right then. So that news article that they visited before they went to the area with no cell covers, they can still look at that one. They might not be able to look at anything else, but that's a whole different discussion. Um, you can do deferred requests. 
you, what that means is if they're submitting data to you, you can hold on to it until they get back online. Now, there's some things you need to think about there because you're dealing with synchroni uh, synchronizing requests at this point. There's hurdles to jump over there, but you can do it with service workers. And there's more. Comp there's a few other more complicated things, and I said I'll give you a site that you can go look at with a whole slew of recipes and neat ideas of things you can do with service workers. Okay, next thing, and I mentioned that in our big old wheel is being app-like. Um, you are building a rich native-like experience. Um, most everybody here, I'm assuming, is familiar with React. Um, and one of the bigger people in the React community is Ryan Florence. Ryan spends a lot of time talking, a lot of his time talking about like the behaviors of smoothing out, smoothing out UI behavior within an app. And he spent, had a whole big thing recently about why don't we have animations like you see when you go to the Apple App Store and you click on an app and it takes this little thing and makes it, it expands out to this big screen, the whole big screen. When we saw we, most web apps you click on, you, you'd click on that app and it'd just do a whole page navigation to the new thing. You're building apps now. You need to start thinking like you're building apps and start thinking about those types of pieces. So you need to do things like animate your transitions. And you need to do things like pay attention to navigation. There are subtle things, and this is where you're gonna fall into the Uncanny Valley trap really quickly. Um, one of my former coworkers, uh, Ian's as well, uh, Andrew Sardone, one of the things he always used to just complain about with all the React Native apps was the way the navigation bars behaved because they didn't behave quite right. They were close, but not quite right. You need to pay attention to the way navigation works when you're doing modal navigation and what that means and what title bars you show in certain situations and things like that. So you need to pay attention to those things. And you need to start thinking about people are going to navigate your sites in ways that you haven't thought before. So they're gonna be scrolling with their fingers and swiping back and forth to navigate and things like that. And you need to think about, if I'm gonna make this, oh, I'm gonna make this whole big thing clickable. And then all of a sudden they touch the screen and they navigate to a page they weren't attempting to navigate to. You need to think about what areas are touchable, what, how things are gonna behave. There's a whole new series of events, but the big one to look at is the pointer events. Um, pointer events will cover most of the things that you're gonna be concerned with. Basically, pointer events cop capture the stuff around mouse events, but also a lot of the stuff around touch events, which were these two separate protocols for a while. Pointer events kind of brought them under one shelf for you. Um, you need to be fast. You need to behave like a native application. If most of our transitions behave went at the same speed that they happen on a desktop application, that will drive you nuts on your phone. Things need to happen quickly. Um, and the Follow on to all this, we get to the next place we're gonna to go to. So app-like, right? The reason why people use apps at the end of the day is they trust them because they're safe to use. Um, your, this is one of the things we need to make sure that we are doing as we're building apps, making sure that they aren't violating users' expectations about safety. Um, they are safe to use by design. So that means you can't accidentally leak stuff by not being using HTTPS, because the web apps essentially require HTTPS. You can't make an installable uh, progressive web app that's not on HTTPS. You can't install a service worker if you're not on HTTPS. Get on HTTPS. If your website isn't running on HTTPS right now, then you're probably doing something wrong. Um, it's one thing if you're just a simple news site, you can maybe make the argument but you don't know what else you're potentially exposing your users to by operating off of HTTPS. So get your site on HTTPS. With free, it's, with free uh, certs from Let's Encrypt, for example, at this point, there's very little excuse for not doing that. Um, they're also sandboxed via standard browser technology. So browsers have gotten really good at keeping uh, your apps separate from one another right now, um, even to varying different degrees of keeping stuff like we still have to deal with cross origin cookies and all the nasty things you can do and things you should tell your product owners that you shouldn't do because it's not nice to your user. Um, but for the most part, we're, you're not going to crash one web app with the other web app. Um, how many people remember the good old days of, hey look, I went to this web app, I went to this new website and my entire browser crashed. Now the tab crashes and you, move, you close the tab and you move on with your day. Um, and it's you know got 20 years of good secure web technologies for making sure that we don't like expose any user. Oh, um, there's a lot of good tools out there now to help make sure you keep your website safe. 
and that you don't expose your users in ways that you shouldn't make sure you're using them because they, the knowledge is out there, we're just really bad at applying it. It'd be nice if we could start baking more of these things into the basic tooling we use so that we don't do it and we've gotten better at some of it. It's harder in things like React or even Handlebars to accidentally um, insert things into the DOM in ways that would run scripts and things like of that nature than it used to be. Though a lot of we've tackled some of those, some of the low hanging fruit, but there's still a lot of it out there. There's still a lot of ways to, hey, look, I I've uh, a lot of cross site scripting attack, or I've allowed this problem. Look for the tools that will help keep your site secure because that's going to keep our users safe. If they don't feel safe at the end of the day, if we continue to break the user's trust by exposing their details online, they won't trust progressive web apps. The reason they trust their, their regular applications is because they have a trust that they're not going to do things that they shouldn't be able to do, right? They're not going to, and when they get called, like when those apps get called out for doing that, they get lots of blowback and normally get delisted from the app store. Um, React needs to be discoverable, which means it's a website. So guess what? You get some discoverability by free because Google crawls everything. So if you can get on Google, your site's going to be somewhat discoverable. Um, once they visit the website, guess they'll be able to install it. Um, this isn't the friendly little annoying banner that pops up whenever somebody... So if you go to Reddit and you get the nice little thing that says, hey, but this is better viewed in our mobile application. That's not this. Please stop doing that. <laughs> Please. Um, there's progress, progressive web apps can be submitted to the Google Play Store and actually listed directly in the Google Play Store, the actual progressive web app. Um, the Microsoft Bing uh, and the Microsoft Store will actually search across them and create your progressive web app for you. <coughs> I'm really not completely sure how I feel about that, but it does it. And then there's Apple. Um, you can install progressive web apps in Safari in, on iOS. The problem is letting your users know about it. It's buried under the share menu um, to get to, so it's not something that's like readily do it. If you go to a progressive web app in, on Android within, on an Android phone within Chrome, it will tell you that it's a progressive web app and give you the chance to install it. But you have to, you're gonna have to figure out a way, if you're detecting that they're on an iPhone, and that they're all set up to do a progressive web app, you have to figure out a way to tell them how to get there. That they need to click on these couple things to go and do the install. Please, it'd be nice if Apple made that easier for everybody, um, but as of right now, that's the world where we live in. So re-engageable, everybody knows these things, right? Um, we all live in this world now where our phones talk to us all the time. You can do that. You can actually, via your web app, push a notification to a user's home screen, just like any other push notification they get. Um, the steps are not difficult. They give you permission. So you pop up the thing, you ask for permission. Um, if it's granted, you set up the subscription and there's a couple of bits of work. You pass some information um, over to Google or Apple with some keys. I'm, so this is a longer talk that I need to walk you through in a like sit down for an hour type situation. But you pass in keys to Google, Apple, and you set up push notifications. And they, you get a specific code that you store on your server that when you wanna push a notification to that phone, just like you would under an iOS LAN, you push it to this code with this key and it will send things along to the user. Um, and then back in the service worker, you set up to show the notifications and it does the job for you. It's not terribly difficult to set up. There's pieces out there to do a lot of it for you. Um, but basically the moral of the story is you can draw users back into your application, which is the holy grail of apps, right? In websites is user engagement and getting users to come back to where they are. Um, so you can do that and re-engage users into your application in ways that you haven't been able to do before. Um, this also applies to things like desktop notifications on a user's computer. Can do the same thing through the desktop through the desktop things and show actual desktop notifications that aren't diff different than when they get an email message or a Slack message. You can bring them back to your website in ways that you didn't always have the ability to do before. Okay, this is the place where you're going to hear me rant about 
bad behaviors websites do all the time and we need to stop doing it. Um, I go to a news site and I get this, you know, hey, you want to, would you like to get notifications of when something changes? And then I go to another site and I get another one and then somebody else gives me one and then I, I'm just, please just make it stop. Why, why do you need access to my browser tabs and what's been closed? What, what is going, going on here? Um, my, the thing I'm going to talk about here is being responsible about what we ask permissions for. If we keep asking the user for permission for everything, anytime they come visit our site, we are going to put users in a mindset of never ever wanting to give permission for anything. So let them know what, um, that you're going to do it before the browser does. So if you think you have a good use case for pushing desktop notifications to your users or pushing them to the home screen of their phone, talk with your user, present them something that says, hey, you're, this is a to-do list. Would you like no a notification when one of your things is about to be due? Um, we can do that. Uh, would you like to do it? And give them the option. When they click yes, then make the browser call to ask them for the notifications because you can warn them ahead of time what they're going to be seeing. You haven't violated their expectations. Tell them what you're gonna use it for, right? Make sure they know, I'm asking for push notifications. That's, if I'm going to ask to know all of the tabs you have open, I better be able to give you a good reason for why I need to know all of the tabs you have open or all of the tabs you've closed. I personally can't think of any reason why I want any other website to know those, that piece of information, but if I'm gonna ask for it, I better have a good reason why. Um, and the th thing that comes along with that is, if you now change the reason you're using the, no the permission they gave you, make sure you let them know. So that means you need to be cognizant of the changes you're making to your website, the permissions that they're taking advantage of, and if you've changed the underlying presumptions of the user, let them know so that they have the chance to do it. And that comes with the follow-on of then make it possible for them to disable it. This is a place where this overall ecosystem could still get a little bit better. Um, a lot of these things need to be unfortunately disabled through browser control panels and it's crappy. It's getting better. There's there are proposals out there to allow the, a lot of these things, just like I can pop up a thing asking the permission, I can send a signal to disable, because there's not a lot of argument to be made for why you shouldn't allow a user to be able to click some, and disable a thing and just be able to tell the browser, hey, the user said disable this. Granting permission is one thing, turning it off is a different thing. But make sure you give them a way to do it, and that might be some, might be you giving them instructions on how you go turn the, the feature off that they enabled, but make sure you have, a, you have built in the mechanisms for them to disable that from their site. So your app needs to be installable. Traditionally speaking, um, PWAs can be installed to the home screen, so we'll, get, we'll cover that. Um, again, it has to be HTTPS, and we need to define, to do this, we need to define an application manifest. So why do you want your app to be installable? Something, there's research out there that says something along the lines of 90% of the time users spend on their mobile devices are spent in applications not on the mobile web. People use apps, not the browser. You want to get them into your app, you need your app to be on their home screen. They need to be able to click the button to take them to your app. Defining the application manifest, um, gives you a mechanism to do that. There's a few thing, hoops you need to through, go through and you can research the specific hoops. It has to do with time spent there. They normally have to visit the site more than once before you can offer to install, be installed, but it can, it can totally be done. Um, like I said, that's, there's some restrictions. You can't, the first time they visit your site, you can't say, hey, do you want to install me to your home screen? Their browsers like put some checks and balances in there so you can't annoy the crap out of your users so we don't end up down the notifications route all over again on the web. Um, if I see one more news site asking me for permission to send me notifications because I've happened to read one article on their site, I think I'm going to start visiting news sites and saying, well, please just stop. Um, but your manifest is simple. Hey, what's the name of my app? What's the short name, which is essentially the name that actually displays on the desktop? What's, what are the icons? You have to give them the different icon set. What's the URL they go to? What's the background color so that it can match up um, when things launch? Um, is there an orientation? What's the scope? You know, what does it live within? So you can do all of those things. It's a, literally, it's a JSON file that's got about 12 keys total. It's not hard. You set those things up and you're all set. 
as long as you as long as it's there and you point to it with the link at the top of your HTML document, the browser will take care of the rest. It's that simple. Your app still needs to be linkable, just like it was before. Um, this is my comments before. We went down the crazy road of having these deeply na navigable web pages that if you click refresh, took you all the way back to the beginning. Don't do that. Um, PWAs should have should leverage URL space just like your web app does in general. Um, this means that you need to think about all of the myriad things that, that defines of um, things of uh, things like am I doing push state or replace state things along those lines. If you're navigating client side, um, which if you're building a PWA, you kind of have to navigate client side because the server might not be there. Um, so you need to think about all those different things about when it, what am I doing within the history of this app. Uh, what happens when they hit back, all of those different pieces. It should still be URL navigable. Um, each page needs to have a unique URL. Um, this is especially important when it comes to the service worker and things working correctly when you go to, the, go to a page because those are gonna very much define how the browser, the browser ends up caching things for you. Um, so you want every page to have a unique URL. Don't forget those navigation animations. I keep coming back to this you notice there's like six or seven themes that keep reoccurring in this and it's because they tie everything together. This is how you get to thinking like a mobile developer. Um, they also power up your notifications. So those notifications we said you can push out to users, one of those things they contain is a URL. So when they click, when they tap it, it gives a URL directly into your application. So it'll launch the app, go straight to it, and put them in the right place. You can do all that. Um, they give you a way to say, hey, I just got a new email. You built a progressive web app email client. I just got a new email. I can tap on it and go straight to the email rather than going to the list of all the emails and having to tap on it again, right? Same type of behavior that you expect the native application to give you, you need to build into your mobile app. And one of the things is by making it linkable, you allow yourself to do that. Um, so there are some caveats to building progressive web apps. You have about 50 megabytes of data to work with. Um, I so was talking with someone, I work at TED, right? We have two major um, mobile applications. Um, our main application is the same thing that you go to the TED site, you get to watch the videos. Um, 50 megabytes isn't enough to store almost any of our catalog. Like we're talking, it's not enough to really store a video, let alone the terabytes of data that we have. Um, so. It's not, been, it's not the right fit for our mobile application. Um, but again, people don't expect to be able to see videos online, so maybe they can browse the catalog. But you need to think about, what am I building? Is that space restriction something that I need to deal with? Um, games also might not be the best choice. Um, there are getting to be better technologies for running things fast within mobile browsers, uh, without, within browsers, period. Um, Mobile browsers are on a battery with an underpowered processor compared to anything you're going to run on your desktop. Those native, those JavaScript APIs that can make your game run fast inside of their desktop browser are probably going to eat the battery of the user's phone alive, also turn it into something roughly the temperature of a nuclear reactor. Um, I would suggest not trying to build a lot of progressive web app games that are highly end. Um, if you've got a game idea that doesn't require a lot of like visually complicated graphics, then it might be a good fit. But for typical animated type games, probably not where we're at quite yet. Um, but guess what? There are people who've done it. There are actual web apps out there, progressive web apps already that are games. So like, I'm telling you yes, no, maybe. Uh, you can experiment with it. Um, just be aware of the limitations of what you're working within and what the structure that you've got to work with. Um, they don't have access to everything yet. Um, so there are the other application in Tedland that we deal with it, uh, uses a lot of Bluetooth access and it's a lot of real-time Bluetooth type access. Um, one of the limitations that progressive web apps have is they don't run in the background the same way a native app does. So when your phone, when you go away from the one application, it's in the background. It has much less ability to do stuff than it does when it's in the foreground, but it's still running and can do certain things, can have access to certain things like events, location <laughs> events and things like that. Progressive web apps don't have that, um, at least as of yet. But that said, if you only need to be able to access things when your 
application are open and might be a good fit. There are Bluetooth APIs coming out to let the browser actually talk to Bluetooth devices. I don't know if that's awesome or terrifying, but it's coming. Um, you can already access things like the camera. You can, there is a whole myriad of web APIs out there now that can allow you to build very complex, rich applications right now, and there's certain things that you just can't get to. Um, so if you have a great idea for an application, go look and make sure that like the underlying things, other things that you need to that aren't having to do with like the basic application level stru application structure level are present in web APIs that you can actually access. Um, so uh, wrapping things up, um, the big thing that I kept harping on there, you need to think like a mobile developer. You need to think about those animations between screens. You need to think about keeping the application fast, that my screen size can be different and in different orientations and all of those different things. Those need to be in the forefront of your mind if you're building progressive web apps. All of those ideas, guess what? They scale out to a desktop application, great. So if you start from that, start small, work big, make it bigger aspect, if you start by building a progressive web application, it's really good, easy to take that idea and expand it out to a full desktop app and it gives you a very structured way to approach your thing. It also forces you to make very hard decisions early on about what you're building and why you're building it, um, that if you have all of the space in the world again, those decisions you tend not, you just say, oh, I can throw this thing in and this thing in and this thing in. Again, living in that constrained space can a lot of times can make you, help you make good decisions in the first place. So you gotta make it fast, right? Users don't, it, I don't know about you, if I open, if I open an app and it takes for, forever to do something, very frequently that app's deleted off my phone within a few minutes, right? I have a very low tolerance for the app not working the way I expect it to almost immediately. It needs to be fast. Um, you need to concentrate on the experience, right? It needs to be app-like. It needs to be some, once your progressive web app has made it to the desktop of the user's phone, they should not be able to tell whether it's a web app or whether it's a, um, whether it's a native app. Those should be indistinguishable to your user at the end of the day. So you need to spend time crafting the experience so that it behaves in that manner. Um, you need to learn service workers deep. Um, like I said, the good news about service workers is you learn them, you get everything set up, and then mostly they just go off and quietly do their jobs in the background and do make it possible for you to do really amazing things without having to think about it too hard. Um, but You've, you need to learn all of the things they can do and all the power that they can give you with what seems like a relatively limited thing, right? You're giving me a network proxy and you're expecting me to change, make that change how I build applications. And the answer is when you start thinking about what that enables you to do for a web app, for a web application, it opens up a whole list of things. Um, so, uh, some resources, and I will get these slides over to, uh, uh, pushed out, tonight, uh, these are all links, but Smashing Magazine has a great set of articles on progressive web apps. They like step you through piece by piece how to build one, your first one. Um, Service Worker Cookbook is actually put a spin-off of MDN, but it's specifically when I was talking about all the different thing, myriad of things you can do with service workers, this has like literal, literal complete code examples of how you go about doing that. Step by step, what the goal, you know, this is the overriding goal, then they'll show you, give you a demo of it, and all the working code that they use to get there. Um, they'll tell you things that are more difficult, things that have like caveats of, hey, this is like a, the naive implementation, and these are some other things you're gonna need to think about, but they've got all that pieces there. Um, the Google developer site, because Google has been very instrumental in the PWA realm right from the beginning. I had one of the people who coined the term literally worked at Google at the time. Um, they have a whole slew of things. And second piece of that that involves, which while I don't use Chrome on a day-to-day -day basis, inside the Chrome, one of the things I still do touch um, when I do uh, my side work on PWA stuff is opening up Chrome. There's the audit tab inside the Chrome inspector. The audit tab will tell you whether your site is capable of being a progressive web app or not. It will go through the checklist of things that are required to be a progressive web app. So it'll make sure you have an application manifest. It'll make sure you have a service worker installed. Uh, all the other pieces that are involved in doing that, that you can work offline in that and they'll tell you how you're doing on that. They also have a, that 
If you have never used the audit tab within Chrome, you need to take a look at it because it's also really good at telling you things like accessibility, performance. There's a whole slew of things that it will tell you about your app that you may never have looked at before, and it's a great place to look. Um, lastly, my go-to site for any of the details like of the underlying technologies for any of this stuff is MDN. If you Google something and it returns you a W3 schools link, scroll down, find the MDN link, look at that instead. Um, MDN is really great about actually giving you what the original spec says something should do, giving you working, giving you examples, and then they actually will even go as far as on the bottom they'll tell you what browsers support individual features. So if you've got a question of is this supported browser, you don't have to jump over to can I use to look at look up the feature there to make sure that you can use it. Um, they will on MDN they actually include all the different browsers and whether a technology is supported in different browsers. So it's a great resource for any of your like top level questions about what you're looking at. Um, that's all I've got. If you've got any questions, I'm not running out the door immediately by any stretch of the imagination. Um, that's my Twitter handle. Um, I will get my email up again on the event. Um, you can also get me at, I'm not hard to find at Ted either, I'm Matt L at Ted. Um, feel free, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Real quick, uh, do you happen to know if you can use uh, biometric security on your behavior? Um, I think there's certain, I remember seeing something about access to, that's not gonna be PWA specific, It's a that's gonna be a browser API, and I remember about seeing something recently, um, but I think it's still in pretty early draft. Um, to be able to access them. Um, and it's mostly got, it's figuring out what can be accessible. Like even things um, on the native level, like Face ID is very restricted in terms of what applications are able to get from Face ID. Um, it, there's just pretty tight restrictions a lot around a lot of the biometric stuff for reasonably good reasons, I yeah. think. <laughs> Any other questions? Thanks, Thanks everybody. Cool. And I don't think anyone